Welcome back, all you cat lovers, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today's tour takes us to the downtrodden and unsightly Midgar from Final Fantasy VII Remake. We'll start off in Sector 7, the first open zone of the game. Something I like about the remake's interpretation of Sector 7 over the original is that it feels more lively. This really is a community of people all going through a shared struggle. You truly feel that. People painting buildings, sweeping, fixing roofs. You get the feeling that everyone is willing to chip in however they can for the good of the community. There's so many little groups of people doing their own thing. Like these guys gathered around a TV. They'd no doubt want to keep informed after the recent Mako reactor explosion, so it makes sense a lot of people would be gathered around here. I also love all the little shops and stands. Look at all these doodads that are no doubt useful to somebody. Huh, it has a blank sign at the top. I wonder if there was some Japanese text and they removed it, but didn't add any translated text, so it's just empty. Heading down this alley, you can visit where Wedge lives, and by god, he really is a cat person. I can feel my allergies acting up just by looking at the screen here. And of course, there's the little cat hideout in the middle of town. Cute little area to be in. But man, why are there just so many cats here? Neither of the other hubs in the game are absolutely infested with them like Sector 7 is. I like the unique identity it gives this area though. For whatever reason, Sector 7 is cat heaven. Let's visit the item shop. Say, isn't it weird that this is called the item shop? It's like calling a place a thing store. I mean, he does sell items, so I guess it's not wrong? A poison antidote makes sense as something a person in a place like this would need. But a phoenix down? How does that actually work in world? Are you able to bring back a family member that died of natural causes? Or what if they were hit by a truck and you could simply bring them back to life? These are all questions I probably shouldn't be asking. Kinda empty in here. Would expect to see more shelves in a shop like this. Though maybe he keeps all the goods behind the counter and in the back room for safety reasons. Through this passage is a secluded little area. I imagine this is a nasty spot where some dirty dealings happen. It really is away from prying eyes. It's kind of funny how empty it is, though, compared to the rest of town. With how cramped it is everywhere else, you think they'd be chomping at the bit for just more space to build shacks or shops. But the world designers needed a space for you to fight some enemies during this section, so I get it. Heading east out of town, you got a good ways until the train station. I found this poster board and wanted to take a closer look at the stuff on it. Huh. Most of it is untranslated. That's kind of surprising. I guess it's even more surprising that some of them are partially translated. Like this says in English, we work hard so you can live well. But there's also this bit in Japanese. Maybe it was like that in the Japanese version? I don't know. You probably do have to pick and choose what to translate when working on a game this big. No reason to go through the effort of translating tiny low-res textures like this when 99% of the players won't even notice. There's a lot of people gathering around the train station. Trains stopped running recently, so it's probably more crowded than it would be, usually. I love people watching in this game. There's this kid trying to pet a cat hiding under a bench. Yeah, just stick your arm under there. I bet that'll go well. These kids are completely geeking out about trains. It's hilarious listening to them babble on about the intricacies of one model versus another. Though if you were a kid in a place like this, I'm sure you'd find hobbies in weird places too. They seem pretty damn knowledgeable. I'm sure they'll grow up to be excellent train... people. There's this couple having a real intimate moment. But as you stand by listening to them, the lady straight up says, We're being watched. And the guy calls you out, saying he's flattered but they're not into that kind of thing. I love this interaction. It pokes fun at the fact that you really are just standing around eavesdropping into people's conversations. 
It would be weird if that happened to you in real life. Maybe I should respect these digital people's boundaries. Nah. Alright, last spot before we move on. You thought I forgot about it. Seventh Heaven. This is one of the spots I was super excited to see in the remake. It's such a chill place early on in the original, I knew they'd do it justice here. Sure enough, this is peak comfy. It's beautifully rendered and feels so welcoming. I like looking at all the little details they had to add, considering this low-resolution image was all that existed of Seventh Heaven in the original game. Menus, signs, bottles, a chalkboard with Tifa's handwriting? I feel like you don't see a character's handwriting in games that often. At least, I don't usually take notice of it when it's there. But it's interesting to think that this is somebody out there's actual handwriting, and they just signed it as Tifa. I wonder which artist that was. There's a license plate up there that says Final Heaven, LOC 053. Huh, that feels like a reference to something. Oh, Final Heaven is her final limit break, and she was born on May 3rd. Cue references. We like to chill at a cafe? Yeah, okay. There's these pinball machines. The Avalanche crew actually takes the lift down to their secret little area, and man, I really wish you could go down there. I'm surprised they didn't remake that spot for this game. You don't get to see any of that space. And of course, the pictures above the back doorway. Photos of 7th Heaven from the original Final Fantasy VII. That's just the best. Looking at it kind of reminds me of how they definitely did change the layout, but they kept the vibes intact. This holds the spirit of the original 7th Heaven. Next up is Sector 5. You're first introduced to Sector 5 via the church. I covered this spot in the first ever video game world tour because this screen was so striking. The beauty of a pre-rendered background is that the artist gets to fine-tune everything about it to look as appealing as possible. This version of the church isn't as striking to me. It's no fault of the developers, the location itself is beautifully crafted. Little bits of grass poking through the floorboards leading towards the grass patch in the middle. And the sunlight lighting up the flowers is still a great touch. But something about the perspective of this shot hits in a way that this doesn't. That's just the nature of pre-rendered backgrounds. But there's nothing the developers could have really done about that for this game, so it's fine. The slums of Sector 5 are a lot like Sector 7. In fact, it kinda made me think about just how much they expanded these areas compared to the original game. It's easy to forget, but Final Fantasy VII Remake is only a remake of, like, a fifth of the original game? And Remake here is so beefy, it would only make sense that they expanded areas like this. But still, it's bizarre to think that this single screen was expanded to this whole area. The only thing I remember about Sector 5 in the original game was the this guy are sick guy. And that dude isn't even in Sector 5 in this game, he's in Sector 7. But they gave it a new identity here, like with the Comic Sans item shop. Okay, maybe not that, but what about the kids hideout? Back behind some rubble is a little spot where kids come to get away from their parents and play. Cloud's only allowed back here because he helped them, otherwise no adults allowed. It's cute just watching them do their thing. These two taking turns going down the slide are adorable. Cloud saved these kids, so they're practicing to be just like him. I'd say they got the technique down. Right this way is the path you took to save them. There's a lot of these in this game. Long, linear corridors branching off the main hub areas for you to fight enemies in. I kinda don't like most of them because they feel super straightforward and boring. Though the spot at the end of the path is kinda nice. A super rocky place in an otherwise industrial city. And there's even a little pool here. Probably not a good idea to go swimming in there, unfortunately. 
Here's some little shacks. Was this used as storage at some point? It's not like these are supposed to be homes or anything, but these definitely were constructed for some reason. A lot of junk around here, so maybe they wanted to keep some of this stuff sheltered from the elements? Let's head back to town. The orphanage is perhaps the most iconic part of the main slum area. You spend a lot of time helping the kids here. Outside is a cute little place for activities and things. Cute drawings. Inside is nice too. A lot of random supplies in the corner here. Aw, and some adorable drawings of classic Final Fantasy creatures. I love the Tonberry. Too cute. Heading out the western edge of town, you come across a big arena. It's kind of funny how, in this game, you'll see a spot and just know you're going to have a fight there later. I kind of wish they were a bit more subtle with the environment design so it's not completely obvious. Once you do the fight here, there's nothing to see. Since there's no enemies around, it begs the question, what was this space for in World? Maybe baseball games for the kids or something? It's super close to the orphanage, so that makes sense, though they better watch out for wild tonberries. At the end of the western path is the most beautiful area of Sector 5. Remember my whole spiel earlier about pre-rendered backgrounds, and how they let the artist find the perfect angle to show off an environment? I loved Aerith's house in the original game. Sector 5 is so dingy and downtrodden, and when you walk through this pathway, you're flashbanged with nature's beauty. It's shocking to see something this lush in such a rundown city. And honestly, they nailed that reveal in Remake. The way the camera has to adjust to the sudden brightness while you turn your view to the left, it all happens perfectly in sync so you're looking at this scene after it all finishes. They completely nailed the feel of this pre-rendered background in a 3D space here. It's just so chill, what else can I say? The water flowing through, grass gently blowing in the wind, and butterflies fluttering all over. A leisurely stroll through here would be a perfect way to spend an afternoon. It truly is the perfect scene. I guess we should look at Aerith's house rather than just hanging outside the whole time. Oh yeah, this is homey. Elmira did a great job decorating this place. She even has a picture of a kitty cat. This game is obsessed with cats. Upstairs are the bedrooms. Ignore Wedge laying down, this isn't his room. A lot of pictures of flowers in the area surrounding the house. A set of books labeled 1 through 7 in Roman numerals. Real slick, guys. But wait, where's 2? Next bedroom is super cute. I love the goofy little rug under the table here. A picture of the flower bed in the church. Pretty photo. Upstairs is a balcony overlooking the property. It almost feels like you get the classic perspective of the PS1 game, even if it doesn't quite match up. I don't know how Elmira acquired all this land, but man, is it some of the prettiest in Midgar. Even in the original game, being limited to the static backgrounds and all, Wall Market was a stunning place to visit. It felt like a spot the people of Midgar could truly let loose and have some fun. And once again, they nailed the transition into 3D. You know, this is kind of the opposite of the church we looked at earlier. I think Wall Market is so much more meaningful in 3D, being able to look around and soak it all in from Cloud's perspective. It feels cramped here, upbeat. Wall Market feels lively in a way I don't think the PS1 game ever could convey. You get to stand at the foot of this bar and it's like you're really there. Or be in the midst of this collection of people. You get to rotate the camera 360 degrees and be completely immersed. Okay, some spots. There's this hotel towards the entrance that has some untranslated text on it. It feels weird and out of place, considering... Uh, okay, there's some more. And there. And up there. Oh, okay, maybe it's not out of place. 
I guess all this Japanese text went in one eye and out the other during my playthroughs of this game. Here's an alleyway and... whoa. This little doorway with a flickering light is ominous. Looks straight out of Alan Wake or something. Uh, anyway, alleyway. It's kinda spooky back here too. The less of a get attacked by a supernatural force spooky, and more of a get mugged by three guys spooky. There's a juicy chest at the end, but these two hooligans are blocking the path to it. If I was a lower tier street thug, I might avoid pissing off a guy with a sword literally as tall as him. But hey, that's just me. Close by is the Magical Materia Shop, and I gotta say, I don't think there's a shop in the game more chill than this. Look at this dude lounging around like he owns the place. He does, actually. He earned the right to relax like that. Though I don't like that he occasionally pats his leg. It feels like he's inviting Cloud. I'll just ignore that. I like that he collects a different assortment of items than most shops. I'm used to seeing mechanical doodads and gizmos, so all these magical crystals are a welcome change of pace. One final place to look at in Walmart, and it's a doozy. Corneo's Mansion. He does not mess around when it comes to showing off his wealth. He flaunts it. Look at that building. Whew. He's got this beautiful bridge going over what's probably some pretty nasty water. Definitely don't want to go swimming in that. Inside is... well, Leslie won't let me in just yet. He's a good guy. He means well. We'll just come back later. Okay, it's later. During the day, Walmart is a little less glamorous. Okay, okay, the mansion. Through the doors that were previously blocked is a path with another set of doors. Opening those, you finally get to go inside. Alright, I think this guy's got too much money. It's not enough for him to have an extravagant mansion. It's literally piled up inside with expensive nonsense. Look, literal gold bars. He's hoarding gold bars. Of course he is. Upstairs, we got some rooms. This one is a mess after Tifa and Aerith wrecked house. Here we got the Don's office. It's an office, all right. Got your office things, like some paperwork, a cute plant, life-size statues of demon creatures, all that you'd expect to find in a place like this. What you'd perhaps not expect to find in an office is a door leading to a tunnel that takes you underground. At the end of the tunnel is... uh... a dungeon? Whether it's for pleasure or torture, I couldn't say. I'm sure the Don finds time for both in his busy schedule. Okay, definitely have the torture tools right here. Wouldn't be a dungeon without these. That's the scariest thing in here. I kinda like the look of this room, obviously excluding all the evil devices. I don't know why this came to my head, but it kind of reminds me of the vibes underneath the Shinra mansion in Nibelheim, around where you find a Vincent. This look would be perfect for a room like that. Final room is his bedroom. I don't know what to say. It's the bedroom of a creepy old guy. I wonder what the character on his bed stands for. Any Japanese speakers out there, sound off in the comments and let me know. In the middle of his room is a trap door leading to the Walmart sewers. He got to use it on Cloud, but I wonder how often he used it before that. That seems like a thing you might not get to use often, but when you do, you're glad you had a massive trap door to the sewers below installed. I haven't used mine yet, but I'm waiting for the perfect moment. Okay, I need a detail to close out this section on. Uh, he has a karaoke machine? Mildly interesting enough. That'll do. Two spots real quick before visiting my favorite in the game. Chapter 15 sees you escaping the slums to break into the Shinra building. The lighting in this section is absolutely beautiful. The whole sequence is about climbing upwards to reach the top plates, but even early on you really feel the scale of Midgar. Look at this view! I honestly didn't expect to be bringing up pre-rendered backgrounds as much as I have in this video. 
but the game is actually using them here. When I played this section for the first time and caught a glance at the landscape in the distance, I had to stop and appreciate it for a moment. Just the fidelity and scale is so impressive. It's not often you see such big environments as the background to a scene, let alone having them be as detailed as this. Like this would be insane to render in real time, right? Especially at a playable frame rate. And it's definitely not perfect, you can see the seam down there. But man, big picture, it definitely works. This shows that pre-rendered backgrounds still have a place in modern games. Chapter 16 has you arriving at the Shinra building. The interior of the Shinra building has a nice aesthetic, but there's only one thing I want to point out during this chapter. The stairs. It's honestly hilarious that while the elevator is presented to you as a way to get up to the higher floors, you can just choose to take the stairs, and you'll be climbing a long way. I noticed that the camera goes a little fish-eyed during this section, contributing to the sense of uneasiness you feel while climbing. It took me nearly 10 minutes to reach the top, and it's funny that the characters slow down as you approach the end. They're getting super winded. Like this is a real ass moment. Could you climb 59 flights of stairs? I couldn't. But even if I could, I still bet I'd be good and exhausted by the top. I love that this is an option and that they included it in the remake. It feels weird to call a staircase going up 59 floors a spot, but this is my video. If you got beef, leave a comment and I'll be sure to not read it. My favorite spot in the game though is at the beginning of the next chapter. After Cloud has a little episode, he wakes up in a bed. Not just any bed, Aerith's bed. In her room when she was a child and lived in the Shinra building with her mom. They were doing all kinds of tests on her, and Aerith would be left here, alone. It's cute how, despite this essentially being a prison cell, they turned it into a homely little spot. Like with this rug, the couch, and of course, the beautiful mural. It represents the promised land of the Cetra. It really does seem like a paradise. So many creatures, and everything's peaceful. And look, there's Aerith and Defalna. Absolutely adorable. This kind of represents the inherent hope built into Final Fantasy VII. Despite being in such a nasty situation, Aerith thought to dream of a place with no problems. A paradise. Everyone in this game fights for a better future. There should always be a small sliver of hope that tomorrow will turn out good, even if it seems like it won't. This artwork embodies that. Check out either of these videos up next. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe if you subscribed to the video. Support me on Patreon, but only if you really want to. Got a few more Final Fantasy VII videos on the way, so stay tuned for those. Thanks for watching and see you next time.